sure by now. God, you would have reached down, wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. Once again, I say amen, and it's still raining. As the thunder rolls, barely hear you whisper through the rain.
Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Who is James? That's a, a big question for now for 2,000 years. And there have been many uh, people have written who they think James was. There were several men in the New Testament named James. But really, it comes down to two main uh, people in the New Testament. It could be James, who was the brother of John and one of the twelve apostles. Uh, and that, I, I would like for it to be from him because he was with Jesus. It was James and John, uh, the sons of thunder, the sons of Boanerges. And they were in that uh, close-knit relationship with Jesus. Remember, it was always Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus when he raised the dead. So he, James, uh, James, the brother of John, was right there. Of course, John wrote the Gospel of John and the three letters uh, from John and the book of Revelation. So it just seemed, it fits real nicely uh, that this James, who was the brother of John, would write this letter. I like that. However, James... This James, James, the brother of John, was beheaded uh, in 44 A.D. He was one of the very first martyrs of the New Testament. And unfortunately, it's impossible that this James, who was martyred so early, would be able to write this letter for us. So that leaves us. Uh, the other contender would be James, the half-brother of Jesus. You remember... Uh, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, and then later he had brothers and sisters who were born from Joseph and Mary. So he would be a half-brother. We find that in uh, Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus goes home. He was raised in Nazareth, carpenter's son, and he goes home and he begins to teach in the synagogue. Matthew uh, 13 and verse 55 the, the people that saw Jesus grow up there take offense that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. This is the kid they all watched grow up. And they say, isn't this the carpenter's son? 
Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And so they're all there together. James is the brother. Uh, aren't his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. And uh, the thing that uh, bothers me, I guess, the most about James being the author is that while Jesus was alive, while he was on the earth, James did not believe that he was the Messiah. So James grew up in the home. He knew uh, Mary was his mother. Uh, he saw Jesus, but he did not believe. Uh, James, uh, John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verse 5, even his own brothers did not believe in Jesus. So we find that, that hard thing. But after Jesus rose, uh, died on the cross, was buried, rose from the grave, Jesus appeared uh, in resurrected body for 40 days and nights. And he appeared to uh, many people, including his brother, James. That's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3, Paul says, uh, I received, I passed on to you of first importance. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised the third day, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve apostles. After that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living. And then he appeared to James, his half-brother, and then the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me. And so after the resurrection, James, uh, his half-brother, placed his faith and trust in Jesus. And he became a leader of the very first church in Jerusalem. You'll find that in Acts chapter uh, 2 and 3. The Holy Spirit comes and uh, James becomes the leader. And so then when Paul and Barnabas come back from their mission trip, primarily that first church was Jews who had received Jesus as the Messiah. They're called Messianic Jews. That's in Acts chapter 2. And they were baptized. And they joined this new church and became the first church. But they were all those who had been Jewish followers, Jewish believers. But they accepted Jesus as the Messiah. That was the very first church. And James is the leader of this group, the half-brother of Jesus. And so in Ash, uh, Galatians chapter 2, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul and Barnabas are coming back from their missionary journey, and they have been missionaries to non-Jewish people called Gentiles. They would be the Greeks. They would be folks from uh, the different areas of the world. They might have been Latin, Roman citizens, or the Greeks, or they might even have been from Tennessee. We don't know for sure. But they were not Jewish people. They were called Gentiles. And so they came back and reported that God was revealing himself to non-Jewish people. That was a new thing for the church. And so Galatians chapter 2, uh, Paul's ministry to the Gentiles, for God, verse 8, God who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the Jews was also at work in me as an apostle to the non-Jews. And then verse 9, James and Peter and John, these esteemed pillars, gave me Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized God's grace to me. And then later on in Acts chapter 15 is the first church council. They deal with this issue. Can non-Jewish people be Christians? Can they believe in Jesus? Can they be baptized? Can they receive the Spirit? And they had this first big council. And who was there as the sponsor of that first church council? It was, it was our James, the half-brother of Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph. And the council uh, votes on this. They listen to Paul and Barnabas. And when they finished, James, our James, spoke up. And he said, brothers, listen to me. Simon Peter has described us how God first intervened and chose a people for his name and gave them to the Gentiles. So that's, uh, I believe, we're talking about this letter from pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And I believe it's Jesus Half brother. And that, that makes it special that as he writes, James uh, is the one who grew up with Jesus. And Mary was his mother. Joseph was his uh, father. 
So in James chapter 1, verse 1, I would not have started off the book that I, I think that's, that's wrong. I would have said, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary, and I think you ought to listen to me because of who I am. But J James doesn't start off that way. And Jude, we have a little book in the end called Jude. That's also James's half-brother. And both of them start off their books not saying, look at who we are. We're from the original family. So listen to us. They start off, this is James, servant, bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James does several things in that very first verse. He, he, he gives glory to his master now. James, Jesus is not his brother. Jesus is not one that they need to bring home to Nazareth and take care of. No, Jesus is now his Lord and Savior. And the second thing that he does there is he says, Jesus and God are the same. That's huge. Jesus is not a prophet or a brother or someone from Nazareth. Um, I am a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. They are one. Um, Jude does the same thing. I'm a servant of Jesus and the brother of James. That's another reason that I say it's the, the half-brother of Jesus. Because Jude, in his introduction, says, This is Jude, and I'm, and I'm the brother of uh, James. So who is he writing to? Uh, in this, in that first verse, he says, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Whenever you see the word twelve tribes, that's another word for the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the twelve tribes. Uh, we're reading through the Bible, and we're reading about that now in, in Numbers, the twelve tribes who are wandering through the, the tribe. But he's writing to them, and uh, the reason we know that he's writing to them is because throughout this uh, letter, different from Paul and different from Peter, he writes to those who are gathered in the synagogue. The first Christians were Jews. They met in the synagogue. Synagogue means gathering. And they believed in Jesus, and they heard stories about Jesus, but they met in the synagogue. And that's what James uses in his book. Instead of, uh, the word is ecclesia, called out as church. That's the word that Paul is going to use much later, and Peter, uh, when they write their letters. And so, uh, it's that first church. So he's writing to these Jews who have been scattered because of persecution. Uh, uh, this happened in Acts chapter 8. If you remember in Acts chapter 8, Stephen, uh, the, who was one of, the, uh, one of the deacons, he stood and preached to the Jewish people, and they got so mad at him, the Jewish leaders, that they stoned Stephen to death right there at the end of his sermon. Um, guess who was standing there holding all the uh, coats and agreeing to this and overseeing this? Saul, who was Paul later, who was saved miraculously on the road to Damascus. But after that, it says in Acts chapter 8, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, they had this great event, and they, the, the, they had 3,000 baptized in one day. And so this church, and then James, our James, becomes the pastor of that church. But there's a tremendous persecution, and they're scattered all across Asia. And now, uh, James has heard from these new churches all over Asia some of the problems they're encountering as they try to form a new church. They don't have the New Testament. Uh, they don't have a set of commentaries, the Broadway Bible commentaries. They don't have Lifeway Sunday School material. They have stories that people are sharing about Jesus uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so he's going to write to them and deal with these difficulties. They're having... Uh, they're having persecution without, and they're having conflicts within. Uh, they have formed, they're forming a superficial, formal religion, like they came out of with orthodox beliefs, but, but it proves to be selfish. And they're starting to live ungodly lifestyles. And so Pastor James writes to his 
churches, people that he knows, scattered out, undergoing persecution and having uh, doubts. So we know that this is the, the date. It's going to be the first book. I don't have a date for you, but James, our James, is going to be martyred in 62. Uh, he's going to become a martyr. So sometime between the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus was crucified in 33. And sometime between that and 47, this letter goes out. And we know it's probably the first book. This is probably the first book of the New Testament that was written, not Matthew, but this book, because uh, there are no, he doesn't mention Gentiles, and that's a big topic for Peter, for Paul. Uh, there are no Judaizers. Those were the Jews, uh, in the first Jews, they were saying, okay, if you're a Gentile, to become a Christian, first you have to become a Jew. Remember that? That conflict uh, that was in the church that almost drove it apart. Uh, there's no mention of Paul or Peter that we find in the other letters. Uh, there are no developed roles. He, he doesn't mention pastors and deacons and uh, spiritual gifts and all those things that we find later on. And, and as I mentioned, he uses the word synagogue for the gathering instead of the word church. So that's just kind of a, a background. And uh, I wanted to share that as an introduction. Uh, but it's interesting to me that, that he starts right off. He doesn't start off with... Uh, these are the things you should believe. Uh, these are the things you should be doing. But in, but in the very first, he introduces himself. Uh, he says who is to. And then the very first words out of James's mouth, through the Holy Spirit, to the church, consider pure joy when you go through all kinds of trials. So you see that James is talking to us. I know, I look at each one of you, I know, I know that every one of you are going through some kinds of trials. Um, the, this is not just a word for the church 2,000 years ago. This, this word from the book of James is for Bell Road Baptist Church, mm -hmm. August 2022. I don't know if you remember several years ago, Laura Silsby. Uh, there were some ladies, uh, there was a great uh, tragedy in Haiti, and uh, they had many of these tragedies, but several of the Baptist women from uh, Boise, Ohio, uh, Idaho, Idaho, went to Haiti to try to form a team, and they wanted to rescue some of these homeless children because of this, the destruction, uh, and bring them back and find them homes. Well, the government got all upset with these women, and uh, Laura Silsby and nine other of the Baptist women were arrested and charged with not having proper documentation to take these children out of Haiti. It was a big mess, a big government mess. And Laura Silsby was actually, uh, she was arrested and found guilty and kept in prison in Haiti for 100 days before our prayers could get her out of prison. Now, imagine a, a destroyed country, third world country, a women's prison for 100 days. I would not survive a prison, especially in a women's prison. <laughs> 100 days. But listen to Laura's testimony. Listen to her testimony. There were definitely things about it that were so incredibly challenging, she said. She's a member of Central Valley Baptist Church in Meridian, Idaho. But God transformed that valley into a mountaintop experience for me. He showed me it was also an invitation to know Him more intimately and immerse myself in His Word and cling to His promises. We can say like David did in Psalm 63, His love is better than life. And our lips will glorify Him. I can truly say that He is so faithful in that regard to show me the joy of knowing Him far surpasses all earthly joys. How could you say that after a hundred days in a Haitian prison? She said, I believe God wants us to embrace trials that He allows in our lives as divine opportunities to know Him more intimately and to boldly share our faith with those around us. 
And I want to share that testimony from Laura Silsby uh, just to say uh, to you that, that when James says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials, that's not 2,000 years ago. That's not some letter uh, to the first church. James, through the Holy Spirit, is speaking to us. He's speaking to you and to me. Your trials. And he says, consider it pure joy. And I, I want to share with you that that's not a unique verse in the Bible. In all the Bible, I went and found the one verse about joy and trials. No, it's a theme. It's a theme of the New Testament. Uh, Peter, in 1 Peter 4, we've talked about that chapter many times. In 1 Peter 4, he's writing to the church. And he says, dear friends, listen. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange has happened to you. But, listen, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. Rejoice! Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. That's Peter. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Uh, Paul is in prison. And he writes to the church about peace and hope. And he says, not only so, Romans 5, 3, but we glory, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. He wrote again in Philippians. In Philippians, he's in prison. And he's writing to the church of Philippians. They send him a gift. And Paul, chained to the guards, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. This message is to us. This message is to us. Consider it pure joy whenever uh, you have trials. And what James is saying here, and what Paul is saying, and what Peter is saying, is that when trials come, when that doctor's visit comes, when that loved one passes away, when that pain presents itself, do not be surprised. You see? Do not rise up from that trial and shake your fist at God and say, why are you doing this to me, God? I thought if I accepted you as Savior and received you as Lord, I thought there would be health and wealth and everything would go great. I've got a Bible verse right here I found about that. See it? But that's not the, that's not the message of the New Testament. We, do, we, we accept those things. Don't be surprised. God uses trials to test our faith. Not for God. God knows your heart. We test our faith for us. Are we real? Is this real? Is it genuine? Is it the real thing? And, and another thing about these trials is the Bible doesn't say to deny the pain. Don't deny the pain. We don't deny the heartache. We don't deny the grief. We don't deny the hardship. But we receive it from the Lord. Um, we see in... Paul instructs us, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It's okay to weep. It's okay to feel pain. It's okay to feel grief. It's natural. Uh, when someone dies, we don't just jump up and down and say, well, they're with the Lord. Or when we have pain, we don't say, oh, it's okay. We, we feel that pain, and that's okay. When Jesus went to see his friend Lazarus, he was dead. And, and Jesus saw Mary, who was weeping. He didn't say, Mary, don't weep. Jesus wept. Jesus wept from grief. So it's real. These feelings are real. Hebrews 12 says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. It's real. That pain is real. It's, it's, it's not natural to to joy, rejoice in trial is not natural to our human beings. So we don't feel guilty, but we just find a meaning and a purpose through that. First Thessalonians 4, 
Uh, Paul is talking to the church of Thessalonica. And in verse 16, he says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and a voice of the archangel and a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up together with him in the clouds. So we will be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. There is pain. There is loss. There is grief. There is hardship. There is trial. But Jesus is coming again. Amen. Lift up your heads. There's a trumpet sound out there. And we're going to all be caught up together with the Lord forever. Amen. And that's what we have that the world does not have. Just think of those without Christ who walk through grief, who walk through pain, who walk through cancer, who walk through the aging process with no hope. That's all there is. Oh, we've got to get that message out. Uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. The psalmist said, the psalmist said, weeping may last for the night, but shouts of joy come. Psalm 30, verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I read the testimony of uh, Toby Borland. Toby Borland uh, is a, a minor league pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. St. Louis Cardinals minor pitcher. And his four-year-old son, Lays, uh, was determined to have brain cancer. Four years old. And uh, Toby shared with his uncle, he said, before my little boy dies, I just want to be able to see him smile. That's what he was, that was his prayer. And Borland said, not long after that, a little blaze in a coma, Borland was sitting at the foot of his hospital bed. His prayer came true. I turned and looked. He had his eyes open. He was looking up smiling, Borland said. I jumped up and ran over. I put my hand under his neck. I picked him up. I felt his chest. He was smiling and looking, but he wasn't breathing. He died right there, but I got to see him smile. Then, he said, uh, this 14-month battle with brain cancer was gone, two surgeries. At the same time, he was going through a divorce, a rough divorce. His brother was dying of AIDS, and Borland had a tumor taken out of his jaw, and he had to have what's called a Tommy John surgery on his pitching arm, which meant that he couldn't pitch. All of that. And so, uh, after Blaze died, he had, he, he had questions for God. I was a Christian, and I asked, why? Why? But somewhere along the line, I changed the why to who. Borland came to the realization that God would take care of him through the trials. Things kind of started falling into place. My faith grew. I knew God was in control of everything. It was tough. It was a tough time for me, but I grew a lot. And he said the difference between a mountain and a valley, nothing grows on a mountaintop. But the valley is always fertile. If you look at the times in your life, where you're at the lowest part, that's when you really get close to God. I've been through a lot, but I've really been blessed. I don't hate God. I love God. Amen. That's the personal testimony. And that's what James is talking about in this, the opening lines of this book. Count it joy when you face trials. And, and we can say, that's silly, that's dumb, that's impossible. No, it's not. Here, here's example after example today of your brothers and your sisters who've gone through immense trials. And in that valley, in that prison cell, in that uh, hospital cancer ward, they found joy. Amen. And that's what separates us from the rest of this world. God's sovereign over every trial. That, that, uh, let's look at the third verse. Remember that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. A Sunday school teacher today, Brother Richard, he said he was talking about praying for our neighbors. He said, do you ever pray for patience? And I said, no way. <laughs> I never pray for patience because that comes from trials. Right. Be careful what you pray for. Right. 
But God is sovereign over every trial. That word develop, that word develop is Psalm 37, 23. Psalm 37, 23. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, see, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Listen, brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, the Lord, the creator of the universe, is holding you up. That song we sang was so beautiful. Uh, why do I keep God in a little box when you're the creator of the universe? Why do I keep you here in this little box at Bell Road in Sunday school? You're down there at, at the church on Bell Road. No, he's, he's the creator of the universe. He's sovereign. And then the rest of that verse develops perseverance. These trials are going to produce endurance, perseverance in our lives. Uh, when we encounter these kinds of trials, counting it all joy, because it's going to produce this kind of patience. And then verse 4, we're out of time. Verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Friends, listen. That is a process. That's not a decision. That's not getting saved. That's not being baptized. That's a lifelong developed process of going through trials, trusting in the Lord, finding joy because He's in control. He's upholding us. He's testing our faith. We're staying true. We're enduring to the end because Jesus is coming back and we're maturing and growing in Him and we become complete. When, will I get, when do I get my certificate <laughs> that I'm complete in Christ? When Jesus comes back. Amen. When Jesus comes back, we all get a certificate. <laughs> and I want to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yes. Let, let, let perseverance, let perseverance finish its work. We can keep on praying. So why have prayer meetings? If, this, if these hardships are tests and trials, I shouldn't be bringing it before God. Well, let, me, let me give you an example that I treasure. I treasure these verses. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Thank you, Lord, for putting this in the Bible for me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul, the Apostle Paul, has shared about these visions and mysteries. He's been allowed to see Jesus after his resurrection. He has been allowed to see heaven. And he's been taught. And then he says uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. You know, Paul always had a thorn in his flesh. Now, now what did Paul do? Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul prayed and asked God to remove this thorn. We can pray and ask God to heal and to cleanse and to comfort. But God said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my prayer, my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's called submission to God. We can pray for one another. We pray for healing. We pray for strength. Uh, we, we pray for these issues. If you have a trial in your life, we will pray for you on Wednesday night. But here's our prayer. That God's will will be done in your life. That's, that's what we pray. Not that this will go away. Not that this will be done. Not that it will be fixed. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. We pray God's will. That, that's the sermon on my Father of art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's our prayer. And we submit to that. Maturity is a, a process. Let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, lacking nothing. One more testimony. In closing, uh, Fred and Nancy Gray. Fred and Nancy Gray both faced life-threatening illnesses. Uh, Nancy had cancer. Two weeks after Nancy's last chemo treatment for the aggressive cancer, 
that she had battled. Uh, the Grays moved to Memphis, Tennessee. They moved from Memphis down to Destin, Florida, and they wanted to retire together. They got over that. They got a, a, a trailer, a mobile home, and they moved down to Florida to retire and rest. Well, that's fine, except that Fred developed heart disease. And so Fred uh, had heart surgery, and he survived his heart surgery, and the Lord reminded him that they still had purpose for his life. So Nancy, Nancy uh, got over hers, Fred recovered from his. It's not that cancer is worse than heart problems or other life illnesses, but with cancer, you've got time to think. And I was faced with my mortality, and I really wanted to do something with my life. We wanted to serve the Lord, so we made a commitment to go anywhere and do anything the Lord asked us to do. Well, guess where God sent them? He sent them to New Orleans, where there was Operation Noah. New Orleans area homes rebuilt. After the tragedies that they had in, in New Orleans, uh, there were still homeless people. And they, the Lord sent Fred and Nancy Gray and their, their trailer to New Orleans to work with the Home Mission Board, Operation Noah. We knew this is where God wanted us to be uh, the very first week we were here. Uh, Fred said, it's not kind of fun. It's really fun to talk to people about the Lord. You talk about what you know best. I know my testimony better than anything. And Nancy said her personal trials have deepened her ability to relate to those in need. She, she gave several examples. Life is not about possessions, Fred said. People want to be happy, but what better way is there to enjoy life than by serving the Lord? These are testimonies of your brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone through terrible trials. But through them, they have learned to Rejoice, And I want to give that to you uh, today as we start this a journey through the book of James. These trials that each of you have. Don't let the evil one push you down. Stand on top of you and jump up and down. Stand up in the trial. Praise God. Thank Him. Find out what He's teaching you. And use that trial as a testimony. Yes. A testimony that will inspire everyone else. Let's stand together for a word of prayer.